So welcome everyone to the Stony Brook School. My name is Joshua Crane and I have the privilege of being the head of the Stony Brook School. I also have the privilege of introducing our speaker tonight, which I will do in just a moment. Tonight's lecture on a Christian's place in politics is part of the Stony Brook School's participation as the only secondary school in the country in the Staley Distinguished Christian Scholar Series, a project of the Thomas F. Staley Foundation of New York. The Thomas F. Staley Foundation is firmly persuaded that the message of the Christian gospel, when proclaimed in its historical fullness, is always contemporary, always relevant, and always meaningful to any generation. To this end, the foundation seeks to bring to the colleges and university campuses of America and the Stony Brook School, distinguished scholars and artists who truly believe and who can clearly communicate the Christian gospel to students. Well, in the polarized climate in which we live, it would not be hard to imagine that some of us are here tonight because we believe this speaker is in our tribe. He was part of the Obama White House. We happen to be major supporters of President Obama, and therefore anyone appointed by him has to be worth hearing. Conversely, there may be some of us here who are asking the question, is this guy's faith legitimate? How could a Christian possibly be part of a Democratic White House? Such categorizations are the unfortunate fruit of the reductionistic age in which we live where we have sized people up in toto according to their political affiliations. If you listen closely this evening, I believe you will be invited to embrace a higher plane of thinking because the Christian gospel does not fit squarely into Republican or Democratic compartments. Words like liberal or conservative don't do it justice. It's far more nuanced and far more holistic than any human categories can describe. The Christian gospel, which we embrace here at the Stony Brook School, says that the God-man Jesus Christ died in order to save his enemies. And when this truth gets hold of a man or woman, it changes everything, even how we view our politics. Well, there are a few people I have met who have thought through these issues better than our speaker this evening. Michael Ware is the founder of Public Square Strategies, LLC, and a leading expert and strategist at the intersection of faith, politics, and American public life. As one of President Obama's ambassadors to America's believers, Michael directed faith outreach for President Obama's historic 2012 re-election campaign. Michael was also one of the youngest White House staffers in modern American history. He served in the White House faith-based initiative during President Obama's first term, where he led evangelical outreach and helped manage the White House engagement on religious and values issues, including adoption and anti-human trafficking efforts. Today, Public Square Strategies LLC is a sought-after firm that helps religious organizations, political organizations, businesses, and others effectively navigate the rapidly changing American religious and political landscape. Michael is the author of Reclaiming Hope, Lessons Learned in the Obama White House about the future of faith in America. He also writes for The Atlantic, Christianity Today, USA Today, Relevant Magazine, and other publications on faith, politics, and culture. He serves on the National Board of Bethany Christian Services, the nation's largest adoption agency, and holds an honorary position at the University of Birmingham's Cadbury Center for the public understanding of religion. He is also a senior fellow at the Trinity Forum. Michael and his wife, Melissa, are both proud natives of Buffalo, New York. They now reside in Washington, DC. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming a good friend of mine and a good friend of the Stony Brook School, Michael Ware. Well, uh, it's a great honor and joy to be with you uh, here this evening. Uh, I've been looking forward to being here at the Stony Brook School for months, and I'm excited to meet as many of you students, faculty, members of this community uh, as I can while I'm here. 
Uh, I'm here this evening to share with you a bit of my story, uh, some of my thoughts on how we ought to think about politics and the role of faith in American life. Uh, we'll be sure to reserve some time at the end for any uh, questions you might have, and I look forward to that portion of our evening as well. Uh, I, I will just say, I, um, you know, it, it's been uh, pretty incredible to be able to travel the country over the last few years, especially um, I had a book come out in the beginning of 2017 called uh, Reclaiming Hope, and it was an experience I, I really didn't think I'd uh, ever have the opportunity to write a book, but, but the opportunity came and I, I took it, and it was one of those things that um, uh, well, I was just super excited about it. And one of the things, so, so, you know, the publisher will try and set up kind of marketing opportunities. And at one point in the lead up to my book coming out, I got an email from, uh, from my publisher asking if I'd uh, like to do a trailer for my book. And that sounded very exciting, uh, like, a, like a movie trailer. I was hoping there would be explosions and uh, uh, various special effects. Um, and so they were sending down a, a videographer, which I thought was special. I didn't have to pay for it. My publisher paid for it, so that was nice. Uh, and the day before the videographer comes, um, I am chasing my cat around my house and stub my foot on our coffee table and break my toe, um, which would be fine, except the entire premise of this trailer, which unfortunately is available on YouTube, uh, is just B-roll of me walking in front of various monuments. Uh, Lincoln Memorial, Jefferson Memorial, the Washington Monument. Uh, and so my trailer that I thought was going to be very exciting for this book ends up looking like a sequel to Forrest Gump. I'm just limping in front of the Lincoln Memorial, limping in front. Um, all that to say, some things that there's a lot of built-up anticipation for uh, don't quite live up to the hype and uh, however much anticipation there was for me being here with you tonight, I hope uh, no one stubs any toes. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some big issues today, and so I thought it might be helpful to provide a bit of context on my background and how I ended up working in politics and Christian leadership. I grew up uh, upstate, which does exist for uh, you all. There is, there is a whole other state. Uh, <laughs> uh, grew up in Buffalo, New York, uh, the son of a single mother who worked multiple jobs to keep our family afloat. Uh, I was very close to my grandfather, and I, I think my early interest in politics was probably due to my admiration of him. He was greatest generation, fought in World War II, came back. He wasn't a hyper-partisan guy. He wasn't, wasn't very political, but he was very civically minded. He served in the local union. He was the kind of guy who just people went to for their problems, solving problems in, in the town where we lived. Uh, and that was, that was really meaningful to me. Um, growing up, my family was not particularly religious. Uh, in Buffalo, it seemed as though everyone was Catholic. And I came from a big Italian family, and so we were Catholic. It was a faith of kind of rituals and rhythms that gave structure to the weeks and years. Now, religion was, quote, uh, like brushing your teeth in the morning, my mother says, you just did it. So a rousing call to spirituality from my mother. I really appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> the millennial generation is the first to grow up in a time when religious skepticism is pervasive and accepted in mainstream American culture. Like many of my peers, I internalized messages about religion that I did not really understand myself. I was convinced the Bible was self-contradictory, though I had never read it. I viewed religion as a crutch without interrogating the actual experiences of religious people. I believed religion was anti-intellectual without considering the brilliance of the religious people I knew or the fact that many of the great intellectuals of human history were religious. In the same way many, uh, many in previous generations considered themselves to be Christian because it was reinforced by their peers and culture, I assumed God was unknowable and irrelevant if God existed at all. And yet I could not escape God. This God who did not exist was everywhere. It was in the music I listened to, was in the shows that I would watch. He ended up in my home. Uh, it was a real inside mission. My older sister came to faith. Um, uh, a few years before I did, so spoiler alert, I became a Christian at, at some point. Um, my sister um, 
was in college, got involved in the youth group, became a Christian, and immediately started working on me. It's hard enough to get away from an evangelist when they live one room down. Uh, it's really difficult. Uh, and so she would kind of uh, try and you know, walk through scripture with me, and we'd get in fights. I was a very typical younger brother who was always trying to sort of poke at her and that kind of thing. And I remember one time um, she was trying to uh, walk, walk me down Romans Road, for those who are familiar with that. She was trying to read Romans with me, and uh, I picked up her Bible, and I just chucked it at her, just right at her face. Uh, and so that was like a good, good sense of where I was in my, in my, uh, in my religious life uh, at that point. Uh, a bit later on, she asked me if I'd go to her youth group, and I thought, well, maybe I'll go to this youth group, get some more ammunition to show her just how silly all of this is. Went to the youth group, hated it, couldn't fit in, didn't understand what they were talking about. Uh, but on my way out, there was a young volunteer, a good Italian guy, Joe Vacani, uh, who was handing out tracts of Romans. No commentary, no illustrations, just, just Romans. And uh, I took it home that night, and I read it, and I read it again, and it changed my life. Three days later, as my sister was dropping me off from school, I told her I'd given my life to Christ, and everything had changed, uh, just as Joshua said. Uh, I, I, you know, there was a season where I thought, well, I better just forget about politics now. I'm a Christian. I've got to go to seminary, become a pastor. I just want to do, like, the most Christian thing possible. Thankfully, I had people in my life who pointed out that there were uh, Christians who were not pastors, and so that was helpful. Um, I had a very observant community around me, uh, which was great. And, uh, and uh, I decided I wanted to figure out what it meant to be faithful in public things. I, I knew two things pretty soon off the bat after I became a Christian. The, the first is that uh, politics was affecting faith, not just the other way around. There's kind of the idea, especially when we're talking about the faith vote in politics, that it's kind of a one-way street, that, um, that uh, people are taking their faith with them, and that's influencing uh, their politics. It was very clear in that sort of moment. So I became a Christian in 2003, 2004, uh, kind of uh, uh, just the beginning of real public pervasive skepticism of the religious right, uh, a conversation about transformation among evangelicals at that point. It was a, a lot of what is conventional wisdom now was just kind of brewing in 2003, 2004. And one of the things that was becoming clear um, as uh, David Campbell and Robert Putnam uh, described in their book American Grace is that actually politics was causing people to leave the faith. So it's not just faith affecting politics, but the way that faith had been enmeshed with uh, partisanship was actually causing especially young people to just leave the faith altogether. So I, I knew that. And then I also knew that I was never going to feel comfortable in politics again. Um, we'll, we'll be talking about this quite a bit tonight, um, but politics, um, Politics tries to put a greater claim on you and your identity than it deserves. Uh, and that's for everyone, not just religious people. For religious people, that becomes uh, exceptionally difficult because our allegiance and identity is supposed to be found elsewhere. And so there's this sort of inherent tension that people of faith feel when they enter the political arena, particularly if they're going to get involved, um, where you will have politicians and parties try and claim ownership of your conscience. Uh, and yet as believers, and I would argue just as, as Americans, it's really important to have a degree of separation there. Uh, so I, I made that decision. I was gonna uh, pursue faithfulness in public life. For me, that meant going to the George Washington University where I pursue, pursued my studies, did some internships uh, early on in DC. Uh, but there was really one pivotal moment that kind of changed everything. Uh, I was involved with a, a campus group, was supposed to be leading a group of students uh, to a political convention at the Washington Hilton Hotel. Uh, I show up to this hotel uh, very naive and very excited. Those two things often go together. <laughs> uh, 
And I'm excited to go to this convention. So uh, I walk in, it's kind of dead, but I'd never been to a political convention before. So I figured, you know, if I just walk around, I'll find this thing. And, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes later, I'm a guy, so I don't ask for directions. Uh, I finally ask the receptionist, you know, where is this thing? And she goes, oh, honey, that's not for another couple days. I just had the complete wrong date for this convention. So I'm, you know, embarrassed and dejected, and I'm uh, leaving the hotel, walking through the lobby, and uh, as, as my head is down, uh, in through the lobby for meetings the day or two before the convention was a young senator by the name of Barack Obama. Uh, he would announce he was running for president about a week after we met, but at that point he was you know, just a senator, so that meant he didn't have a secret service, he didn't have sort of hordes of staff or you know, uh, uh, people trying to get to him. He basically walked up to me. Uh, I had followed his career, and maybe we could talk a little bit about this in the, in the Q&A, but I had followed his career since he became president of the Harvard Law Review, and then uh, right about the time when I became a Christian, he gave a speech at the 2004 Democratic Convention where he uh, said that uh, we are our brother's keeper and said that we worship an awesome God even in the blue states, which was very inspiring to me considering uh, that convention was nominating perhaps the most religiously inept nominee the Democratic Party has ever had, at least up to that point, in John Kerry. And so for this for Barack Obama to take the stage and um, speak so poignantly about faith meant, meant a great deal to me. Um, so he walks up. I told him I want to work for him. Uh, he connected me with staff. And 10 months later, I was in Iowa. Uh, I used to say the cornfields of Iowa, but then I felt guilty that that wasn't exactly true. Uh, I, was, I was in the suburbs of Iowa. That's like less uh, less uh, idyllic, but um, you, you could think I was in the cornfields of Iowa if that if that helps. Uh, but I was in the I was in Iowa for the Iowa caucus. Uh, we won that. Went to Chicago for um, uh, to work in religious affairs for his first election, um, and that started me on you know uh, basically a trajectory that has gone up to this point. Um, especially for the students, I, I just want to. I just want to lay out three things that I think I learned as I entered as an unpaid intern into the Obama campaign that I think helped me uh, as I eventually started to get paid, which was great. All of you should try and do that as well. Um, uh, the, the first thing, uh, uh, three recommendations. The first thing is to find the line between persistence and annoyance and stay just to the left of it. <laughs> so I had no connections. I was a blue collar kid from Buffalo. I really didn't, I didn't know uh, anyone working at the campaign until I met the guy whose campaign it was, which was great. Um, uh, but I just had two business cards of staffers that were with him. Uh, and I would, uh, basically ping them every couple of weeks, every month, sometimes just say, hey, I'm alive, I'm here, if you, if you, if you need any help, this is what I'd like to do for you. Uh, sometimes uh, it would be two paragraph long emails about things I thought that they could be doing better. It was just a matter of wanting to stay on the radar. Um, and that, that was important. I, I think you, you can get the sense that Oh, if they're not responding to me, uh, then that means that uh, th they don't respect me. Uh, that means that I'm not good enough. That means I should just give up. Um, and instead, it's just people on campaigns and people in life generally are very busy and not thinking of you as often as you're thinking of you. And so it's helpful to the extent that you can and being respectful of their time and being respectful of um, you know, their responsibilities. Uh, uh, stay just to the left of the line between persistence and annoyance. Uh, the second thing I'd say is uh, no job is beneath you. Uh, when I first got to the Obama campaign, uh, I thought I'd be um, uh, at, talking with pastors. I thought I'd be writing, you know, who knows what I thought at that time when I was 18. Good Lord. Um, but, but, uh, it ended up being more knocking on doors, 
getting coffee and copies for folks early on. Uh, and what, I, what I've seen, both managing staff in the White House and on campaigns, and then also among colleagues, is often what separates folks. Uh, th there's a concern that if you do sort of grunt labor, that you will always be seen as the grunt labor person. Um, and so people tend to like back off from doing that work. And I would just recommend you to find where the need is and fill that need as best you can, even if it's not uh, what you want to do 10 years from now. Uh, don't puff yourself up so much uh, that you're not able to do the task that's in front of you that will actually be of service to the people that you're trying to serve. Um, so that would be my second bit of advice. Uh, and then the, the third bit would be um, help to have a specialty and a focus. Um, uh, I think there's, uh, there's certainly need for generalists, but especially in uh, in politics, um, if I had been just a general sort of communications person or just an organizer, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that there would have been a pathway for me. Uh, instead, I knew uh, very clearly I wanted to help the president reach people of faith. Um, and what that meant was that when situations came up, say, for instance, then Senator Obama, uh, going to Saddleback Church to speak with Rick Warren, uh, and uh, it's asked in the office, hey, who has read The Purpose Driven Life? And it's me, an intern, and you know maybe one other person uh, raising their hand to say, so I wrote the memo to Senator Obama about, that was the first memo that he read of mine, and it was because I had a very focused especially. So for students in the room who are looking to get into politics or in any other field, I just urge you to dig deep um, and not think that you can kind of um, just skate the surface of the subject here. If you have a passion, you need to really immerse yourself in it. So th those, those would just be three, three bits of advice. I served in the White House for the first three and a half years of the Obama administration. And then previous to that, I was part of the faith outreach team for 2008, as I mentioned, and I had the honor of leading faith outreach for the president's reelection campaign. From those five years at the center of power in our nation's politics, I was able to see up close some of our nation's finest minds try to tackle some of our most pressing policy challenges. I was inspired by much of what we were able to achieve and humbled by the moments, opportunities, and accomplishments that I was able to be a part of bringing to fruition. We got the adoption tax credit finalized. We helped the administration bolster the fight to end modern slavery that I'll talk a little bit about later in my remarks. Uh, and uh, I was able to help the president with his various remarks on the intersection of faith and American life. I, I learned many lessons about our country, our politics, and the way faith intersects with it all during my time working for the president. Some of these lessons were uplifting and hopeful, some of them difficult. And since I left formally working for the president, and as I've traveled around the country over the last few years, I have become increasingly concerned about what politics is doing to our communities, our, relationship, and our relationships, and our souls. And that's what I'd like to spend most of tonight talking about. Religion and politics are the two topics that you're not supposed to discuss at the dinner table, so the saying goes. But have you ever thought to think about why this is the case? I mean, how many of you have heard this phrase, religion and politics, all right, uh, uh, two topics you're not supposed to discuss around polite company at the dinner table. Um, it wasn't until recently that I came to think that the saying is generally true, but for opposing reasons. People don't want to talk about politics because they hold their views too tightly. Too much of their identity is staked in politics. People don't want to talk about religion because they are haunted by the idea that they do not stake their lives in the spiritual things enough, that God takes up too little space in their life. In his essay, Membership, C.S. Lewis writes, a sick society must think much about politics as a sick man must think much about his digestion. However, if either comes to regard it as the natural food of the mind, if either forgets that we think of such things only in order to be able to think of something else, then what was undertaken for the sake of health has become itself a new and deadly disease. Our culture and many people in our churches are sick with that new and deadly disease. Politics is causing great spiritual harm in America. 
This spiritual harm is reflected most clearly in our national anxiety. The American Psychological Association found that 52% of Americans felt additional stress due to the 2016 election. They called it election stress disorder and recommended steps that people could take for relief. Teachers reported students were fearful about the election outcome, even to the extent that they were having nightmares about it. Political campaigns understand and feed into this emotional pull of politics. Increasingly, political messages are not about policies. Instead, the policies proposed on the campaign trail are about sending a message and propping up a desired narrative. Our politics, and this is important, our politics is both driven by and guiding our emotions. The influence of political tactics is not confined to campaign dynamics. It affects how we are formed as people. Political polarization is at an all-time high. Instead of our values influencing our politics, our political circumstances are shaping our values. As partisans, we explain away the flaws of the candidate we support, and we buy nearly any outlandish theory about the candidates we oppose. We even change what we believe to fit the moment. In 2014, there was a, a study that came out, out of Stanford that was kind of the benchmark study on party polarization. Uh, it had an interesting data point attached to it. In the 1960s, when parents were asked, who would you not want your child to marry? The answer was, I would not want my child to marry someone of a different religion, and I would not want my child to marry someone of a different race. In 2014, the same question was asked. If the parent was a Democrat, they said, I would not want my child to marry a Republican. If the parent was a Republican, they said, I would not want my child to marry a Democrat. Think about what that means. Think about what that means if our most intimate social relationships are driven by something as fleeting, as liquid as partisan identity. We know the political implications of it. We're seeing it right now. But think about just basic social cohesion for how we live together. And of course, we know from other studies, we don't live together anymore. <laughs> we are geographically segregated by ideology. We, don't, we only live around people and with people who think basically the same way we do. It's a major problem. Politics is causing great spiritual harm in Americans' lives, and a big reason for that is Americans are going to politics to have their spiritual needs met. This is the meaning of rising polarization. It's the cause of our zero-sum mentality. Politics does a poor job of meeting spiritual needs, but if it will get your vote, politicians will attempt to fill the spiritual void nonetheless. Our politics can only cause such spiritual harm because our national life has become so spiritually vacuous. What we must recognize, if we are to properly diagnose and treat that which ails our politics, is that the state of our politics is a reflection of the state of our souls. Politicians can only manipulate those most personal parts of ourselves, our longings, our loves, our, hate, our hurts, our passions, and our hatreds, for their purposes because we make these things available for their use. The problem is not that we take politics too seriously, but that we take politics seriously in all of the wrong ways. So in light of all of this, many reasonable people are looking at the role politics is playing in their lives and the lives of those they know, and they're asking a question. If politics can cause so much strife and division, if politics can be used to manipulate my affections, shouldn't I just leave it alone? Knowing that politics has the risk of exposing such weaknesses in us, that it has a capacity for causing such, such harm, isn't withdrawal the best option? And so we are left, it seems, with a choice between apathetic, apathetic withdrawal and political idolatry. I obviously don't believe either of these options are acceptable. We can draw on many places in scripture and in the Christian tradition that would help us understand a different way, but let's talk about Jeremiah's message to the exiles. These people, God's people found themselves in a land that was not their own among a people who despised them, and yet Jeremiah's prophecy to them did not suggest that they lie low or that they take a posture of opposition toward the Babylonians. No, instead they are instructed to seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for if it prospers, you too will prosper. For Christians, one inescapable conclusion of this extraordinary command is that we are obligated to work for the benefit and flourishing of all people, whether or not they see the world as we do or agree with us in any way. A Christian's obligation is not to their tribe, but to their God, a God who cares deeply for all people. 
And if a Christian's political ideas and actions are not intended toward the good of their enemies, their political witness is not Christian in its character. When it is, everybody benefits. When Jesus came centuries later, he ushered in a new era of good news for all people, not just as individuals, but for the world. Near the beginning of his ministry, Jesus shocked and angered those in the Nazarene synagogue by reading from the prophet Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The meaning of this is as clear as it is revolutionary. Jesus came not just to redeem souls, but all things. And the new life that he has welcomed us into is not to be lived in isolation from others. Jesus' commission to the public square can be found in Matthew 5, where he says to his disciples, You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, Christians care about politics because we care about our neighbors and our communities. And political decisions impact our neighbors' well-being. Christian or not, as a citizen, you do not choose to have political influence. You already have it. Therefore, sitting out of politics does not absolve you of blame for the state of our politics, as so many seem to think and talk about it now, but your sitting out is your choice about how to steward the responsibility you've already been given. Faithfulness is not confined to any one sphere of life. It may look different in different arenas, but faithfulness is for all of life, including the political. And a holistic pursuit of justice and the well-being of our neighbors is inconceivable without political involvement. Politics is one of the essential forms in which we can love our neighbor. So what will a better kind of politics look like? And how can faith motivate a better kind of politics? Uh, I'll close by sharing a a few thoughts on this in the form of a discussion of a passage of scripture, an idea, and a couple of stories. When When the Apostle Paul was writing to the Galatians, he was addressing a community that was in deep disunity. Paul had helped the Paul had helped form the Galatians through his teachings, but they were straying from their foundational commitments. Sin, false teachers, and parochial motives and interests were creating, well, polarization. Paul is writing to a a polarized community. And so Paul's letter to the Galatians then represents an attempt to speak clarity into the conflict and help the community reform around its foundations. And it's into this polarized environment that Paul instructs them to do something radical, something completely contrary to everything that polarization promotes. He tells them they ought to, quote, carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the love of Christ. Paul's command shows no favoritism. His call is not to one group only, to those with power or without it, or even solely to the strong or the weak. Everyone together is a part of a community as children of the same God, and therefore they ought to carry one another's burdens. A nation is a different sort of community, but it is a community. And the call to carry another's burden is an extraordinary one, but these are extraordinary times. In our increasingly polarized nation, when many elected officials and their strategists believe they need to listen only to those who already agree with them, We have to carry our neighbor's burdens into politics with our own. We need to ensure those who disagree with us are heard as well. Opening up our narrow politics will not be easy, but it's possible. The resources of hope make it possible. And politics cannot just be a forum for self-expression and the pursuit of self-affirmation. We have to carry one another's burdens. Our politics is increasingly influenced by secularism, by which I simply mean a worldview that presumes God does not exist or that he is irrelevant to our public affairs. This is, as we've already discussed, a view that's affecting many Christians. And it is true that America is experiencing rising levels of religious disaffiliation. In 2007, about 36 million American adults were religiously unaffiliated. In 2014, just seven years later, that number spiked to about 55 million. 
That's an increase from about 16% of the American population in 2007 to 23% in 2014. Most people believe this number is now at, at or above 25% of the American population. As Gabe Lyons and David Kinnaman observed in their book, Good Faith, many Americans believe Christianity is irrelevant to them and their lives. And due in part to these demographic changes, Christianity itself has become parochialized, marginalized relative to its prior status in public discourse, and in some quarters, despised. In this climate, one inconvenient reality is that we actually do not live in a secular world. God, we come to find out, has quite a lot to do with politics. And one contribution that Christians have made to the public, the idea I want to discuss with you, has been an intense focus on the person, on the dignity and worth of the human being that cannot be negated by the pursuit of desired ends. That the human being is never mere collateral, but worthy of great concern. And so Christians have often been at the forefront of great fights for human dignity, for abolition and the advancement of human rights, against abortion and, care and carelessly dangerous nuclear weapons regimes, for civil rights and family-affirming policies, against poverty and for the dignity of work. These are unmoored political slogans. They come out of a view of the person that is informed by the Christian tradition. This focus on the person keeps us from treating political issues as abstractions or becoming unadulterated proponents of man-made ideology. Informed in this way, we will be attentive to the places where our preferred policies, policies create harm. And so Dr. Martin Luther King could argue, a quote, you see the founding fathers were really influenced by the Bible. The whole concept of the Imago Dei, King said, is, the whole concept of the Imago Dei is the idea that all men have something within them that God injected. Not that they have substantial unity with God, but that every man has a capacity to have fellowship with God, and this gives him uniqueness. King continued, there are no gradations in the image of God. Every man from a treble white to a base black is significant on God's keyboard, precisely because every man is made in the image of God. One day we will learn that. We will know one day that God made us to live together as brothers and to respect the dignity and worth of every man. And this is why we must fight segregation with all our nonviolent might. It, it moved directly from a theological uh, conception of the dignity of the human person to arguing for a political cause. Yale's Nick Wolterstorff could say similarly, can human rights survive secularization? I fear that they cannot. Our moral subculture of rights is as frail as it is remarkable. And if modernization does indeed produce secularization, I fear that our recognition of human rights will prove to have been a brief shining moment in the odyssey of human beings on earth. As for myself, I do not fear. Not only is the modern world obviously not becoming secularized, I believe that God has planted the recognition of himself so deeply in the human heart that the knowledge and worship of God will never disappear from the face of the earth. From the UN Declaration of Human Rights to modern efforts to combat human trafficking, the Christian tradition has brought to the fore of our public discourse the dignity of the human person. A perspective that could lead C.S. Lewis to say, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. It is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. And this focus on the person represents just a sliver of the positive Christian contribution to our politics. The scholar Oliver O'Donovan says that liberal democracy, quote, bears the crater marks of Christianity. The impact is all over, whether it's recognized by everyone or not. In the midst of a season of intense political conflict, it, become, it can become easy to forget these things. It can become easy to get distracted. But for all of the strident polarization that has defined our politics and culture, the cynicism and bravado that has defined our age, what we must come to terms with is that this frantic performance belies a lack of confidence, not an abundance of it. Our politics today is a politics of the disappointed or what Parker Palmer referred to as a politics of the brokenhearted. We are surrounded by broken hearts. And this is the source of so much of what we take to be attacks. Stridency is always a veneer. 
And if we look around us, there are points of light breaking through that veneer. We can even look to Europe where secularization has been hailed and where some point as a model for the future of religion in America. It was in the midst of the ongoing debate in her country about migration, multiculturalism, and Islamic terrorism that Chancellor Angela Merkel went to a gathering of the Christian Democratic Union Party that she leads, and she made a provocative argument. She told her party, quote, we don't have too much Islam, we have too little Christianity. We have too few discussions about the Christian view of mankind. Germany, Merkel argued, should view the moment of migration as an opportunity to have a more robust conversation about, quote, the values that guide us and about our Judeo-Christian tradition. We have to stress this again with confidence. The problem is not that we have too many Muslims, Merkel suggested very provocatively, but, but quote, that our Christians are not Christian enough. In other words, she was saying this is a discipleship problem. Here's what I've become convinced of. There are a range of structural reforms that would help our politics and strengthen our democratic institutions. But at the end of the day, this situation will really require more of us as individuals. So I want to close with two stories about what a, what a positive expression, Christian expression in politics can look like. Um, as, as was mentioned, I. Um, most of my role in the White House was um, relational uh, communications, events, rhetoric. Um, I did have uh, a few items in my policy portfolio, and one of them was anti-human trafficking efforts. And uh, in early 2012, I was uh, briefing a senior member of the White House on uh, issues that young evangelicals cared about. And maybe I had 13, 16 issues in that memo, and we had maybe a 75-minute meeting. Um, on my way out of that meeting, the senior staffer asked, uh, you know, Michael, um, we discussed quite a bit today. Um, if there's one thing that you would like me to take away, one thing that you think would be especially effective and meaningful, what would it be? And I had in my folder uh, a photo of the Georgia Dome in Atlanta that had 60,000 college students packed, it was sold out, for something called the Passion Conference. Uh, the Passion Conference is a, a, a college uh, ministry, um, and uh, that year, uh, run by a guy, Louis Giglio, a, a friend, uh, that year, uh, 60,000 college students gathered not just to worship God, um, though that was the central purpose of their meeting, but also to raise money for anti-human trafficking efforts. Over the course of just a couple of days, these college students raised over $3 million. I mean, it was just a, just a remarkable feat. Ended up on CNN. That was the article I had that I had in this meeting that I hadn't planned to show. But when the senior staffer asked me, I took it out and said, well, look, 60,000 college students uh, just packed out the Georgia Dome because they care about this issue of human trafficking. And so that stuck with the, with the senior staffer. Because, right, he could see this wasn't just talk, this wasn't just rhetoric. The, these kids had literally put their time and resources into this issue out of love of God and love for their neighbor. And so within three weeks, when the president was speaking at the National Prayer Breakfast, he mentioned these students. Three months after that, uh, the interagency cabinet meeting on uh, uh, combating human trafficking was moved from like some basement in the State Department to the East Room of the White House. Uh, in September of that year, the president gave the longest speech on slavery of any president uh, since Abraham Lincoln. And that speech led to hundreds of millions of dollars of additional commitments to combat human trafficking on behalf of the American government. Now, there's a lot that goes out. It, it, it's not, oh, 60,000 college students got together and it led to hundreds of millions of dollars. There were other factors. There were women's groups that had long been advocating around this issue uh, uh, for a different set of reasons. There were other groups, International Justice Mission, uh, 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 Samaritans uh, Women, um, 
uh, other uh, human trafficking organizations that we're advocating. But I can tell you from the inside of the White House that what those college students did made a difference. It wasn't just heard by God. It was heard by a senior staffer in the White House who then told the president, and the president ended up taking action. Christians following their faith and turning their faith as cultivated personally and with the Holy Spirit to then look at how their faith can motivate them to serve their neighbor in politics, in private charity, can make a real substantive difference. And I have one last story I want to tell you about just that. This one comes from my time leading religious outreach for the president's re-election campaign. And it remains a high point for me and a reminder that our politics can create good culture, not just division and insecurity. Uh, Jenna Lee Nardella is something of a wonderkind. At age 22, she co-founded and served as the executive direct director of Bloodwater Mission, a nonprofit that has raised more than $25 million. Uh, Bloodwater has uh, brought water to more than a million people in Africa and provided health care for more than 62,000 people in HIV-affected areas. Gen Jenna Lee Nardella's influence and example have also had an outsized impact on the justice conversation in the American church. The Democratic Convention uh, during, the, during the presidential campaigns lasts three days, and so as Faith Outreach Director, that meant I had six slots to fill for the invocation and benediction each night. And I asked Jenna Lee to serve in one of them. Uh, for an evangelical Christian, the decision to speak at a, an event like a, like a Democratic Party convention cannot be taken lightly. Uh, the last thing you want to do is get involved in a controversy that could harm your ministry, either from anti-religious inquiry or from a donor base upset that you would dare pray with Democrats. And so Jenna asked for a bit of time to consider the invitation, during which she prayed and consulted with her husband and the board of her organization, and uh, they encouraged her to take the opportunity, and Jenna accepted. Uh, I smiled when I received an email from a campaign staffer uh, just a few days before the convention flagging something in Jenna's prepared benediction. Uh, she had included a prayer for Mitt Romney, too. Oh, no. Uh, I assured this staffer that this would be okay and that, well, it was too late to negotiate an alternative and so we just kind of have to go with it. And so on the night of the convention, directly following First Lady Michelle Obama's remarks, Jenna walked out and with heads bowed and eyes closed, she led a stadium full of Democrats in praying for both Barack Obama and Mitt Romney and for our nation. The way that she actually did the prayer was um, it was actually identical paragraphs, and she just replaced Barack Obama's name with Mitt Romney's in the second paragraph. The prayer was a ray of light in a pretty depressing campaign season. Christians and others shared the video of Jenna's prayer online as an example of what can happen when we hold our faith and each other's dignity as more sacred than partisan politics. In an increasingly polarized politics and culture, this is the role that Christians can play. We can take risks in the political arena to affirm that some things are more foundational than partisan politics. And when we see others do so, we can support them as they face people who do not understand. What Jenna taught us that evening was that politics can be about more than winning. And she could only do that because of the kind of person she is. I hope that you will pursue your passions. It's for the students here. I hope that you will pursue your, your passions and think big thoughts and act on big ideas. What an opportunity you have in front of you, in large part because of the education that you've been afforded here at Stony Brook. But I want you to know that technical expertise and all the right ideas will only get you, will only get our nation and our politics so far. Instead, our future, our life itself, will be most fundamentally determined by the kind of person we are, by the kind of people we are. The most fundamental thing I've learned in my last decade plus in politics is that in order for our politics to change, we must become the kind of people our politics needs. This is my prayer for myself and for us all. Thank you.